Thanks for joining us on Sheridan County Ag Update. Today we have Walker Billings, who is the supervisor for the Sheridan County Weed and Pest, and Rachel Mueller, who is a the vice chair of the Sheridan County Weed and Pest Board. Thanks for joining us today, you guys. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. having us. You bet. So let's talk a little bit about what you guys do, because I think maybe some people don't know what exactly the Sheridan County Weed and Pest does. Yeah, so we were established in 1973 um, by the Wyoming Weed and Pest Control Act. Um, so we're a special district. Um, that, that act established a weed and pest control district in each county in Wyoming. Um, and we have the responsibility to establish responsible programs for the control of um, designated weeds and pests. Um, so we have a, a state weed list um, that we manage, and then we also have a county weed list that, that we manage. Um, we're, we're a special district that operates through county taxes, um, and we provide all sorts of different programs for the control of weeds for residents of the county. Um, we have chemical sales, so we have cost share for um, treating weeds that are on our on our list of on our list of weeds, um, and we we provide chemicals. Most of the time, it's fifty fifty, but it depends on the weed for what that cost share is going to look like. Um, and, and we have um, mosquito programs and prairie dog programs, and, and uh, you might see us out spraying on the roadsides along the county roads all summer to control weeds on the roadsides. And um, we're, we're here to help, um, especially the private landowner, in controlling weeds. I would say another thing people may not know is how cooperatively we work. Um, we work really um, side by side with the University of Wyoming to get the best research and the most up-to-date up technology and research to move our programs forward. And um, the Wyoming Department of Agriculture, um, Forest Service, BLM, we're, we're very cooperative in how we move forward with our, with our programs. I mentioned that um, each county has its own weed and pest district. So mm -hmm. collectively, it's the Wyoming Weed and Pest Council is all those districts working together. So we work very closely with those other county districts. And um, each district is set up in a fairly similar way. Um, and we work very closely. I, I've been talking with other supervisors around the state almost almost daily mm -hmm. um, since I started. I started just in January, so I've been getting up to speed and, and uh, having the collaboration across all the different counties has been absolutely key to um, accomplishing our goals and supporting the residents of Sheridan County. Cowboy State Bank, helping farmers, ranchers, and the ag community succeed for over 100 years. So as, as a landowner in Sheridan County, if I'm out looking through our hay pasture and I come across a weed that maybe I don't know what it is. Um, can I call you guys and you help us identify that or how does that work? Yeah. So if you've got a, if you've got um, a suspected weed out in your pasture in a hay field, um, I would say the first step would be to go to our website. It's scweeds.com. Okay. Um, go to resources and we have a weed identification tab okay. um, where you can go and, and kind of try to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, if, if that doesn't work, then uh, we've got all our contact information also on the website. Um, so shoot me an email, shoot our office an email, give us a call. Um, you can try to describe it. If that doesn't work, send us a picture. You can email me a picture, text me a picture. Um, and if we're still unable to figure it out, um, either bring in a specimen. I would say put it in a Ziploc bag with a little bit of water and keep, try to keep it kind of cool. Um, or, you know, I, I'd be happy to come out and... If you've got a bigger infestation, me or one of my team members would probably be happy to come out and take a look. I think one thing to mention, um, Walker said this, but if you're collecting a specimen, if you're coming in for chemical or just in the area, mm -hmm. um, don't forget to try to collect the roots and the stems and if there's any flowering parts, either the seed or the flowers. Um, that's pretty helpful for, for our team to, you know, Walker especially, probably to look at it very quickly and be able to identify it that way. So. Well, and, and Rachel, when I was talking with Walker earlier, he said that you have a Ph.D. in weed science. I have a master's in Master's, in, in, okay. Yep, Rangeland Ecology. So, you know, you really probably with that got in-depth as far as the different, the weeds and the root systems and stuff, and, and um, maybe talk a little bit about how that spreads, how, it, how these weeds spread and get throughout the county. Sure. Um, well, and Walker can talk quite a bit as well. Um, Walker mm -hmm. is, like I said, um, yeah, mm -hmm. pretty 
well versed in his plant identification. I've been out of it out of it for just a little while. I took a little break to raise um, four wily boys that I'm <laughs> looking after. So um, left my my position at the University of Wyoming. But um, yeah, I mean, plants can spread by their root systems with their seeds. A lot of a lot of our plants, um, our native species, are rhizomatous, so they their root systems are what maintain um, their stability and their survival. Um, but a lot of these annuals that are cropping up that probably we talk about more in our board meetings and, and walkers, mm -hmm. certainly um, on the forefront and, and working really hard on these annual weeds that we're dealing with, they just spread by seed, but they're pretty pretty good at it. So uh, we're seeing a, a real uptick in Ventnata and Medusa head. And, and those. So I don't know if we wanted to go into that depth or not. Well, what, what are some of our most common invasive weeds around here or that you see the most of that we need to, to be on top of as, as landowners and in the county that we need to be looking for? Yeah, I would say one of the most prolific weeds that we have is probably leafy spurge. Um, you see leafy spurge a lot in the eastern part of the county, and then we're kind of worried about maybe seeing it a little bit more in the western part of the county. Mm -hmm. um, now... <clears throat> But as far as most problematic weeds, um, I would say those invasive annual grasses that Rachel mentioned. So most people know the, the differentiation between an annual and a perennial plant. Um, an annual reproduces each year. Um, most of our, our native species of grasses are perennial. So they send a lot of their resources down to their root system at the end of each growing season um, so they can produce in the next growing season. Um, and those are, those are the desirable forage species that you know, ranchers depend mm -hmm. on. Um, to put weight on their livestock. But now as we have these um, annual grasses moving in, they, you know, live fast, die young. They, <laughs> they live, they have a really short life cycle at the beginning of the year. Um, some of them like cheatgrass can actually be decent forage at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. um, but because they have that sped up life cycle and their only goal really is to set seed so they can, um, you know, reproduce the next year, um, they, they don't provide much forage after that initial green up. Um, and then some species also, you know, just aren't, uh, we have like species like Medusa head, which um, you can kind of close your eyes and picture just from the name, um, has some long, stiff uh, structures at the top that kind of spread out like this. Um, and those can be discouraging to animals who would be interested in grazing them. Um, and then, you know, some weeds like Bentonata is kind of the big bad right now. Um, it, you know, accumulates silica, which is the, the building block of, of glass. So it can, it can and tear up a digestive system too. Quality Kubota machinery and customer care from the heart. Proudly serving Sheridan and the surrounding areas since 1996. Go online to heartlandkubota.com or stop by Heartland Kubota 2450 Heartland Drive. It's grazed. So as far as um, most problematic species, you know, those invasive annual grasses are kind of at the, at the top of my mind. Um, <clears throat> leafy spurge again is very prolific in the county and, and can of course choke out all of our desirable forage species. Um, and, you know, the list goes on there. There are a lot of species on the list. Some are poisonous to livestock mm -hmm. um, or humans. Um, and some, some just outcompete the desirable species and, you know, reduce biodiversity, reduce forage value, um, can, and can impact the bottom line of a producer, mm -hmm. um, or they can just be undesirable to look at out in the field. Well, and, and as someone who has livestock, we really have to watch the cheatgrass once it heads out because it – gets stuck in a cow's jaw, she can get lump jaw from it, that gets in their eyes, it helps spread the pain. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that we watch for because of it once it heads out, you know, just from a livestock standpoint as well. So um, what about the pests? I mean, obviously, prairie dogs are at the top of my list, but mm -hmm. what about some of the pest control that you guys help with as well? So our mosquito program um, is one of the... Um, bigger programs that we have at Sharon County Weed and Pest. That's also one of our more popular programs. We get a lot of calls asking at the beginning of each summer, you know, when are we going to be spraying for mosquitoes? Mm -hmm. um, and, and we don't only spray for mosquitoes because they're a nuisance. Um, of course they are, and it's nice when um, <coughs> we have less of them, but uh, <laughs> they, they can also be a vector for West Nile virus. Mm -hmm. um, so early in the 2000s, Sheridan County had a few cases of West Nile virus in humans and in horses, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's when our mosquito program started. And since then, we've been pretty successful um, in, in keeping um, West Nile virus at bay. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also, 
like to say it's just one of the most popular programs with our county residents. We think it's probably dollar for dollar one of the programs that um, supplies the the best benefit to our county residents. Well, I know a couple of years ago when it flooded, it was, I mean, we had them horrible out there on Big Goose. And um, you guys came and sprayed, and, and truthfully, it, I mean, we still had some, but it was a whole lot better. You didn't feel like you had to go outside in long sleeve shirt. and You know, I mean, you actually could go outside and do something. So so what about the other pests um, that, you, that you do? Right, so... Um... Alfalfa weevil is another pest that's kind of been at the top of my mind lately. You mentioned prairie dog. Um, we also, um, pocket gopher uh, treatments have been very popular lately as the snow has melted. Um, a lot of people have been coming in to get pocket gopher bait. Um, we have one baiter and we have a lot of chemical for it. So if um, snow's melting in your yard and you've got a bunch of pocket signs of pocket gophers, <laughs> uh, give our office a call and we might be able to help. Um, I mentioned alfalfa weevils at the top of my mind. Um, we're in kind of a tough spot with alfalfa weevil management in our area. Um, kind of recently, most of the chemicals that we've used to treat alfalfa weevils, um, those weevils have become resistant because of repeated applications. Um, so the chemical is no longer effective to control alfalfa weevils. So since that has developed, costs for alfalfa weevil control have really gone up. And um, as a district, we're trying to take a much more integrated approach to the control of alfalfa weevils and using multiple different tools um, so that we can be as effective as possible and hopefully we can eventually regain um, that old chemical, which is Mustang Max, mm -hmm. um, into, our, into our tool belt. Well, and we were talking a little bit before we got started that, you know, probably the, the biggest crop that's grown around here is truly alfalfa for, for hay production in our area. Um, and, and so I can remember when we had alfalfa back in the 80s that that was even a problem. I mean, I, I can remember my dad spraying for it. So, uh, you know, I, I think it sounds like it's like everything else. It does build a resistance, and you have to find a new new avenue for that. Yeah. And I think the, the weed and pest lord is um, very cognizant of we didn't have a lot of options, and we still don't have a lot of um, mm -hmm. tools in our belt, and so we, we – I think among many people overused that that option, and now now we're having to take a, a step back and say, okay, how can we do the best for the resource and uh, not continue down that resistance avenue? Um, so yeah, our, our board is currently just kind of taking a step back and deciding what's best for our community, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, so we're doing some evaluation, and that's why the program has has made some changes because mm -hmm. um, yeah, you got to do the do the right thing. You always have to be looking forward to at what the new staying on top of everything. Right. So, well, now that the snow has melted and we see we're seeing some hints of green grass and some growing, um, what what do we need to be looking at as as landowners? And maybe there's some people out there, some new people in town who bought some land and they aren't sure what to do. What what steps do we need to take now as as we start to see grasses and and weeds starting to grow? Yeah, I mean, I would say just get outside and look at what you got. I think a lot of people, um, they look at their land and they look at the roadsides and, you know, all they see is, you know, grass and maybe a few flowers. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't they don't take the time to really think critically and think, hey, I don't I don't know that I've seen that one before or something like that. So um, if, if you've just recently bought land or, or if, even if you've owned land for a while, mm -hmm. um, I'd say this spring as, as plants are starting to green up and grow, I'd say just take a walk. Um, if you see anything that looks out of the ordinary, um, you know, take a picture of it, send it to me. Um, we also have weed identification books at the county shop for free. Okay. Um, so if, if you're someone who might not be as familiar with plants, like, mm -hmm. you know, many people aren't, um, I'd say stop by the shop, grab one of our little weed identification books and uh, take a walk around your property. If you see anything that matches something in the book, um, then certainly think about giving me a call or... Um, <laughs> Shoot me a text. Okay. And so um, if, if we find some stuff, do then we just come up to the to the county shop there, the office, your guys' weed and pest office, and visit with you and get the chemical? And is that um, is that how that process works, or do we need to bring that in for you to identify and make sure that that's what we have? I think if it's possible, I think it's best for you to bring a sample in or take a couple good pictures, mm -hmm. um, and we, we can help because um, – 
so you, like you mentioned earlier this morning, um, sometimes people don't get the exact right chemical for the exact right job. You know, they see a plant that looks out of place um, and they say, I got weed, I got some weeds, I'm going to go get, you know, Roundup. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times there are chemicals that are going to be better suited um, if we can identify what specific weed it is. Um, but yeah, once you once we get it identified, um, <clears throat> most weeds, like I mentioned, we sell our chemical at a 50-50 cost share. Um, so as long as it's either state listed or county listed, um, we'll sell you chemical uh, at half price. And um, we also have rental equipment, so um, we can rent you a trailer or a backpack um, if it's a smaller infestation. Um, you can go out and spray it on your own. We've also got a list of commercial applicators um, if you've got a larger infestation. Uh, you could hire a commercial applicator to come and spray your weeds. Um, if, if it's something like leafy spurge we um, and you have a large infestation of it, say you're um, our large operation, a large producer, um, we have a crew that can go out and help with your leafy spurge. Um, I think we're about all booked up for this season. So wow. if we find a big infestation of leafy mm -hmm. spurge, um, just you know, get in my ear and we can probably get you on the list for next year. I, I might add as well, um, if you're new to the area, or even if you're not, if you're a landowner, um, sometimes I think chemical and, and spraying has kind of gotten a bad, a bad rap. Um, I think um, it's good to keep in mind that these were actually developed in a lot of cases um, to be specific to that weed. That they, you know, mm -hmm. if we have leafy spurge chemical that we're <clears throat> selling, if calibrated correctly, on that landscape, they will actually just attack that leafy spurge. They won't damage um, your native grass species around that. So mm -hmm. keeping in mind that sometimes chemical can be kind of scary to, to certain folks that just aren't aware that they were actually specifically developed for that plant to damage that plant and not the other plants around it. Um, so to not be nervous about it or ask questions. If you have questions about specific chemicals or you know, Walker and his crew, our crew at the office, mm -hmm. are just really, really knowledgeable and educated about that stuff. That they'd love to talk to you about that too. If you have some hesitancy, just call them and and they'll talk you talk you through that and just yeah answer some of your questions. So. Well, and that's important to know. Um, of course, like most chemicals that are labeled for a specific <laughs> product uh, for a specific weed are are safe in most cases. But if if there are some reasons why you still might not want to use chemicals. Um, we always like to take an integrated approach to whatever whatever weed we're trying to combat. Mm -hmm. um, so we have non-chemical treatments um, that we use all the time. Okay. We spend um, quite a bit of time in the summer doing uh, leafy spurge beetle releases. So there are beetles from uh, that are native to the same place where leafy spurge is native, um, and in, in its home range, they eat on the leafy spurge. Um, they were properly vetted and, and brought to the U.S., and now we release them in a targeted way. Um, so that they can establish and um, establish populations and eat leafy spurge, and the, the results are pretty impressive. Mm. Um, five years after we do a few releases of leafy spurge beetles, um, leafy spurge is reduced to maybe ten percent of what it once was. Wow. Um, we also have a goat grazing program. Mm -hmm. um, goats are are great for grazing leafy spurge. They actually love the stuff, from what I hear. Um, if you can get them on it, um, so. We have a, a goat crew that goes around um, some areas and, and grazes leafy spurge. Um, and then also, um, there's always mechanical methods. Um, there are a lot of weeds that can be combated by brush hogging and, and mowing and, um, or even hand pulling in some situations. So there, there, are, there are more options than just chemicals. But uh, if, if you have any questions about chemical treatment options or non-chemical treatment options, yeah, give the office a call. And that integrated approach really does make a huge difference in, in the like amount that's decreased mm -hmm. and the time that you see that weed decrease. If you can hit it new, using numerous avenues, you're getting more bang for your buck. I think that that's... Making plans for building a new barn, shop, or commercial building? Don't do any planning without a call to Sheridan's premier post-frame building and homes builder, True Built Builders, online at truebuiltbuilders.com. Yeah, if possible especially on something like leafy spurge, that's just a relentless weed. So, my, my dad's favorite punishment when you did something wrong in the summer was to hand you a shovel and tell you to go cut burdock or, right. or uh, cockleburrs, beggar's <laughs> lice. Yeah, 
<clears throat> I might, might or might not have run a shovel a few summers for that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that was his favorite approach was, oh, well, here you go. That's cost effective. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> and the lesson learned that I didn't do that again. Yeah. <laughs> that's, good. that's good discipline right there. <laughs> well, and, and Rachel, we had talked earlier and when we were waiting and, and Walker and uh, we kind of were joking um, my dad, old school, was, well, maybe more is better, but that's not always the case. More is not always better. Yeah, correct, cali correct <laughs> calibration, and Walker can talk more, more mm -hmm. to this, but really is key um, to not do damage. You're, you're really not doing anything more by putting more, or it's just you're, you're probably just causing more damage than mm -hmm. good. Yeah, I think that's key. Um, a lot of research has gone into exactly how these chemicals should be applied. Um, and yeah, one side not to damage your desirable species, um, but then also, you know, you reach a point where more chemical isn't going to do you any more good, so you're really just throwing your money away. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to note that uh, each chemical has a, has a label from the EPA, and <clears throat> that label is the law, and it mm -hmm. tells you exactly how, it, how it's to be applied. So um, if you're going to go out and, and apply a chemical this summer, I would encourage you to take the label from um, the jug of chemical that you're going to be using Give it a thorough reading. Um, if you have any questions, give me a call. There are numbers to call for questions on the label um, because, you know, the label is the law. You must follow the rates that are on the label. Um, and that's important for environmental health, um, health of your, your land, um, and, of course, your own health, too. Mm -hmm. so. And I think the end goal, right, is to just damage that, that target weed and give our good plants the opportunity to take in those resources that that was once taking up, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and you can just promote that healthy system with the, the good guys, the good mm -hmm. grasses, the good forbs, whatever you have. That's the sustainable way to do it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not to spray it, although you're probably going to spray it year after year after year, mm -hmm. but hopefully you get some of those good grasses that just come in and take over that, that area. That's the end goal. Well, and even if you do have to spray it year after year, hopefully it's a smaller, it continues to decrease a smaller and smaller amount that, that you're doing because they do have the opportunity, your, your native grasses, to fill that in. So Absolutely. And, and I would encourage landowners and livestock producers and to just pay attention to your good grasses as well. And that's to manage mm -hmm. them at an acceptable level, right? Not utilizing them to the point where they're being damaged, then you're really just providing an opportunity for more weeds to come in. Mm -hmm. So pay attention when you're out walking, you know, pay attention to what your grazers are doing, whether those are horses or cattle or goats, or um, kind of make sure you're, you're making responsible choices as a landowner and, and a livestock producer as well. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we wrap things up? I, w I mean, I, I would also like to just say we're going through a transition um, with our office. Um, many of you folks out there and, and you guys probably knew Luke and Amber um, that were at the office before. Um, they got a great opportunity to move on, but we've seen some transition with um, Walker and just hired a new assistant, and they're just doing a phenomenal job. We're really excited about the opportunities and the team integrating them with the team that we have, <clears throat> our office gal and um, you know, some of the other folks that are, were already there, they have been instrumental in, in this transition. We just have a really good thing going, and I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunities. Walker's leadership has just been awesome so far. So I encourage people to get to know the folks at the Weed and Pest office and just pop down and see them. It's a great group, um, and if they have questions, they're always willing to, to answer. But we're, we're really excited to where we're going and the opportunities that we have. So. And I would say if, if you're someone who's either new to the community or you've been in the community for a while and mm -hmm. you haven't utilized weed and pest in the past, but, you know, something uh, through this conversation piqued your mm -hmm. interest, um, check out our website again. It's scweeds.com. Um, on there, we have a pretty thorough list of all the things that we do. And um, if you have any questions about how we might be able to provide support to you, then, um, again, our contact information is on there. Give us a call. Um, but if you're someone who has utilized weed and pest in the past, mm -hmm. um, Rachel mentioned we're going through a transition and we're always looking to improve, you know, the old way isn't always the best way. Um, so if you've got ideas for things that you'd like to see weed and pest do better, then um, I would also encourage you to give us a call and uh, get in touch with me. I'd love to bring on a thermos of coffee and chat with anyone in the county. So um, but thanks for having us today. Yeah, well, great. Thank well, thank you guys so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And and thank you all for tuning in. And for more podcasts, news, and sports, check out SheridanMedia.com.